aren't known for changing history. But in 1749, when the Dijon Academy put on an essay competition, it did. The theme that the essayists were to write on was the rebirth of arts and sciences. And the winner of this contest was a most unusual essay written by an obscure 39-year-old writer named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He took a novel approach in dealing with the idea of the arts and the sciences. He basically dismissed them as artificialities that distance people from a vital connection with nature. And this essay catapulted Rousseau, who was pretty much an embittered uh, layabout, to stardom as an intellectual. Intellectual. And soon, the doors of all the fashionable salons in Paris and uh, all the homes of the elites, uh, the, the kind of progressive aristocratic estates, they swung open to him, as did noble minds and noble purse strings. Rousseau was soon circulating in the set for the next 20 years, filling noble heads with his ideas and draining uh, lucrative financial support from their coffers. Now, ideas have consequences. And Rousseau's novel approach to the arts and sciences, to nature and society, his novel approach to the issues of the day, forever changed the world. He was one of those guys that had a huge impact. And so today we're continuing the series on the roots of liberty. And I've taken the liberty of uh, adding a new theme to the series. This is Jeremiah Lorig's course in which he has shown us the roots of liberty beginning in Jerusalem. Then he took us to Athens and Rome, like a skilled travel leader, travel guide, then to London. And all the while as he has gone, he has shown us how these values impacted our experience starting in Philadelphia in the 1700s in the, in the United States. What I'd like to do this week and next is take us on a sharp turn left to Paris today, to Moscow next Sunday, to show a new direction in anti-liberty. So here we come to Paris, Utopia and the mob. And you can see the guillotine front and center. Rousseau's success marks the rise of all this, marks the rise of the intellectual. With the decline of clerical power in the 16 and 1700s in Europe, a new kind of mentor emerged in European societies to fill the vacuum. The sexual, and meant to say the secular, but the two have been closely intertwined. The secular intellectual arose proclaiming a special devotion to the interests of humanity, okay? Theirs was a self-appointed task, undertaken not on the basis of received wisdom, a tradition of the past. No, this new breed of leader 
this intellectual, claim to diagnose the ills of society and to cure them with their own unaided intellects. And under <coughs> the tutelage of intellectuals, the fundamental habits of humanity could be transformed for the better. We can make a better world. And that's what that word utopia means. Actually, what it means is no place. But they sought to make no place to bring it into this place. Unlike the clergy, intellectuals were not servants or interpreters of the gods or of God. The intellectual saw themselves as substitutes. And the first was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He lived from 1712 till 1778. He was the first to assert the right to reject the existing order in its entirety, confident in his capacity to refashion it from the bottom up according to principles of his own devising. Believing that a new world could be fashioned through the political process, guided by instinct, intuition, and impulse. Maximilian Robespierre said, he believed, no, this is actually uh, Paul Johnson writing in his book, Intellectual, said, he believed he had a unique love for humanity and had been endowed with unprecedented gifts of insight to increase its felicity. And Paul Johnson says ruefully, and an astonishing number of people in his own day and since have taken him at his own valuation. Maximilian Robespierre, for instance, said that Robespierre, that Rousseau is the one man who through the loftiness of his soul, the grandeur of his character, showed himself worthy of the role teacher of mankind. You might know the name Maximilian Robespierre. He led the Committee on Social Safety, um, public safety that uh, ran the guillotines for a year and a half during the Great Terror in France. Rousseau gave birth to six main ideas that have profoundly influenced the modern world. Let's go through them briefly, high points. The first is the cult of nature. We saw that in the essay that won him such a claim. He believed that advanced civilization was harmful to humans. He idealized the state of nature, and he started the quest for freshness and spontaneity, the invigorating natural, the invigoration of nature as the remedy for the artificialities of civilization. He believed in the expressive individual. He sought to liberate people from external conformity to kind of the stultifying conventional wisdom of social norms, of mere reason and convention and tradition. Instead, each person must delve deep into the inner self and express our intuition, our instinct, our poetic imagination. This is the rise of romanticism, the romantic movement in Europe and the United States. He taught the idea, later called the noble savage. Famous quote from Rousseau, man is born free, but everywhere lives in chains. 
You see, the more advanced a society becomes, the more it corrupts the innocence of human nature. Natural human community, brotherhood, is the natural state of human life. And it degenerates into competition for status, wealth, power, superiority over others, hypocrisy and alienation. Society has that effect on human beings. Humans in nature are much happier. He also was quite sharp in his critique of capitalism. They didn't call it that then, but laissez-faire economics. He identified property, the private ownership of property and competition to acquire it as the primary cause of human alienation. The only way to free people was to fundamentally change the culture through what would become social engineering. He was the one who began to develop these ideas that made him persuasive. Paul Johnson called this idea, quote, a thought deposit that Karl Marx and others would mine ruthlessly. <laughs> We're going to see Marx next week. His fifth big idea was a call to revolution. He distrusted rational, incremental steps toward reform. He believed that what was needed instead was a radical transformation of society. The sooner, the better. You had to throw off dated conventions. You had to destroy those oppressive institutions guided by a feelings-based morality, passion, intuition, authentic self-expression. And lastly, the result of this revolution would be the state as father, parent. He believed that the state nurtured citizens as a parent nurtures children in every aspect of their lives, controlling their thinking and their environment. He was very clear on this. In his views of education, state education, everybody, collective education in the state um, being shaped in their outlook and thought, thinking by the government. Today we call this the nanny state. He said, vices belong less to men as individuals than to men badly governed. The key to making human beings free and happy was a well-governed state, <laughs> freeing them from such vices to live out their natural innocence. Now, these ideas came to full expression a couple decades after his death. They came to expression in the French Revolution. And it's interesting to look at those ideas in light of that event, as well as in light of his character, okay? Because he claimed for himself the loftiest of sentiments. And he's got some truly stunning quotes in his letters where uh, he's defending himself against accusations and he really has this extravagant view of his own virtue. But a close look at his character in life, what he did, reveals him to be monstrously vain, self-pitying, manipulative, self-righteous, boorish, ungrateful, paranoid, entitled, 
an immensely cruel man to the people in his circles. Though he claimed to be the most virtuous man of his age, Voltaire, an older contemporary, called him a monster of vanity and vileness. And Voltaire is considered like the other father of the French Revolution. So they are highly sympathetic to each other in terms of their ideals. A monster of vanity and vileness. And what I want us to see as we go into the French Revolution is that his character flaws shaped his ideas, all right? His ideas camouflaged and justified, pardoned his failures as a human being. And when such ideas find mass expression in political movements, like the French Revolution, his personal character flaws become the DNA of the movement, of the radicals that lead it. His faults and failures become theirs. So Rousseau died in 1778 when France was at the height of its Enlightenment period. And at the time of his death, his, his writings were well known in France. And he had much influence among the nobility and uh, a growing breed of fellow intellectuals. And after a decade, they germinated. They grew into a young revolution the first phase of which started in 1789, a decade after his death, among the nobility. So these fashionable salons and the great estates that would open their doors to such uh, fresh uh, and shocking people as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they saw the opportunity with the weakness of the monarchy to push for reform, to weaken the king and to strengthen their noble houses. So they forced a meeting of the Estates General, which hadn't gathered since 1614. It's been a while. They forced a meeting. The Estates General were the three estates. There was a first estate, which were the nobles, the second estate, which were the clergy, and the third estate, which were kind of the commoners. And 1,200 delegates gathered. It's quite the legislature, wouldn't you say? With the king at the center. However, things did not turn out as the nobles had planned because they were unable to form a unified coalition and they were no match for the vigor of the liberal and the radical delegates who also gathered. Control of events very quickly slipped out of the hands of the nobles and the revolution entered a second phase. Notice how the group gets smaller. This gathering was dominated by the third estate, by the commons, who took control and voted to become the National Assembly. They said, okay, we're trashing the Estates General. We're forming the National Assembly we're speaking not for the estates, but for the people. And here's where the language of left and right political spectrum began, okay? It was the people, it was where people sat in the assembly when it gathered. 
You know, what I want you to see here is here now the king is no longer presiding, but the president of the estates of the, of the, of the assembly. And those who gathered on the left side of the room relative to the, uh, to the president were the left, right? So on the left side is the left. And to the right side of the room were gathered, well, this is the right. On the right were those who supported the monarchy and the church. On the left were those who supported the revolution. And one deputy, a baron in the House of Nobles, so he was from that first estate, he continued over here, let's just say he's over here. Maybe this baron was early on, uh, back in the estates general, one of the ones saying, well, yeah, let's, let's try some reform. Maybe he was over here a, a, a very close supporter of the king. Well, by the time we're into the assembly, he's now from the moderate to an extreme. He's, on the, he's an extreme right. He said, we began to recognize each other. Those who were loyal to religion and the king took up positions on the right of the chair. So, and I like the way he put it, so as to avoid the shouts, oaths, and indecencies that enjoyed free reign in the opposing camp. So, you know, if you watch uh, the news, you see, you know, you, the obscenities being bleeped out and, you know, the obscene gestures being, you know, uh, shaded over in the frame. You watch these riots. It was the same then too. So uh, the indecencies enjoying free reign. So, so they're all kind of gathered over here so that uh, they wouldn't be subject to the abuse of the, the radicals over there. But in successive iterations of the assembly, every time it gathered over the next two years, the center kept moving to the left and to the right. It became increasingly polarized. And this side of the room became increasingly marginalized, increasingly depopulated through murder and exile. Initially, when the, when the National Assembly first gathered, the weight of the assembly gathered around what we would call Lockean ideas. And we've heard about those uh, in London last week. In fact, it was led at the center by um, Marquis de Lafayette from the American Revolution fame. He came from what he saw in the American Revolution, the American colonies, he returned for the French Revolution. He joined the National Assembly. He was one of the key leaders at the very center. They were able in a short time to produce the Declaration of the Rights of Men and of the Citizen. They formed a constitution. They, they created a format for a constitutional monarchy in France. They were, however, no match for the vigor of the more radical members of the assembly. And as society and the economy continued to break down in the face of mob violence, chaotic forces unleashed, running rampant increasingly in French society, these folks lost control and were forced out. And in their place, this crowd moved into power.
And so the revolution entered a third phase. When members of the Jacobin Club, who were like this crowd right here, the Jacobins, rode to power on a whirlwind of anarchic insurrection that was breaking out all over France. The power in in mob-fueled revolutions always flows toward the most radical, the most ruthless, the most aggressive elements, the most fanatical believers in the cause. Much to the dismay of more moderate leaders. So these moderate constitutionalists They were mostly lawyers. They trusted in their rhetorical skills, their persuasive powers, seeking consensus on sensible reforms. They even had the American Revolution to point to, to say, see, this works. But the Jacobins, well, they were street fighters. They were ruthlessly intoxicated by a sense of their own virtue. They were filled with a feeling of superior, invincible virtue. And they ruthlessly pursued their vision of utopia. They had a a picture of an ideal society in their head and they would do anything to implement it. And so under the Jacobins, the revolution became more violent. And the more violent, the more assertive they were, the more things fell apart. The more things fell apart, the more violent control they sought to exercise. They formed the Committee on Public Safety So this is before Orwell, but that's a truly Orwellian name for this organization. Here they are. Notice how small the group is now. Power concentrated in the hands of a radical few. They ruled in the place of the assembly. They organized revolutionary forces which were basically street mobs, now organized and armed into militias to enforce Jacobin social policy. Rousseau had dreamed of a society in which a universal compulsory force existed to create the, the, the setting in which people could be free. Well, now his disciples had that universal compulsory force. These Jacobin leaders were all disciples of of Rousseau. One of them, Jean-Paul Marat, he uh, intentionally took a disheveled, unbathed appearance, explaining, explaining that he did so in order to, quote, live simply and according to the precepts of Rousseau. So he was returning to the natural state, like who needs to bathe? Louis saint Just, who was the most bloodthirsty of the Jacobins, made his devotion to Rousseau clear in every speech he gave. He was a famous rabble rouser. And he took those Rousseauian ideas and used them to motivate, to galvanize the mobs. And speaking to the most radical of the revolutionaries, Maximilien Robespierre expressed his widely shared devotion of Rousseau. He said, and you've heard this, Rousseau is the one man who through the loftiness of his soul and the grandeur of his character, showed himself worthy to be the teacher of mankind. 
And Robespierre considered himself Rousseau's worthy successor. Maximilian Robespierre, the voice of virtue. This very compelling photograph is taken from a likeness, from a, a computer a forensic reconstruction of his face from his death mask. So Maximilian Robespierre, who sent uh, countless thousands to the guillotine, ended up suffering the same fate. And someone made a death mask from his severed head. And with 3D uh, scanning, imagery, Im image making, they were able to reconstruct his face. And you can see the pock marks from, he suffered a very severe bout of smallpox. Um, Robespierre dominated the Committee on Public Safety. And what followed was the Great Terror, during which Jacobins found it expedient that many enemies of freedom, as they were called, they must die. And they died in their tens of thousands. Brutal public deaths. The Great Terror to create utopia. It's the vir virtuous use of revolutionary violence to bring about a more just and equal society. This is where it ended. As all utopias, utopian movements end. They end in blame, in failure, because the thing about utopia is there is no place like it. You can't create a perfect society. So when utopia inevitably fails, the finger of blame inevitably gets pointed. And these radicals inevitably kill those that they blame. The guillotine was busy day after day, week after week, month after month. As the radicals killed nobles, priests, anyone whose politics was subject. If you are invincibly virtuous in your political views, then anyone that falls short is a heretic and needs to be destroyed. Uh, St. Just said, we must not only punish traitors, but all people who are not suitably enthusiastic for the revolution. You hear now, silence is violence. If you don't speak out against it, you're doing violence. Same idea back then. The nation was plunged into a brutal civil war as localities banded together to defend themselves from these revolutionary forces. So towns would barricade themselves to keep the radicals out and it resulted in to protect themselves from revolutionary mobs. Now, all this ended, of course, with the execution of Maximilian Robespierre in 1794, it's amazing how quick all this happened, but it was too late for France. Its energies were dissipated, the nation was exhausted and demoralized, and a power vacuum emerged that was filled by Napoleon Bonaparte, much to the sadness of all of Europe afterward. And it was too late for the world as well, because the genie was out of the bottle. The fires of secular revolution, this new religion, had been kindled. And they would go on to burn for centuries. They still burn today. They burn in our cities today. Movements that bear the character and the ideas 
of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Thomas Carlyle, in talking about the French Revolution, he likened it to the Earth's crust, a rind, this is how he said it, a rind floating on oceans of red-hot lava. He said the social order is thin. It's fragile. And roiling beneath it are, well, as he said, the deepest upturn of black burning sulfurous stratum turning up, breaking out, bursting forth. That's what we saw in the French Revolution. And as we'll see next week with Marx, with the communist revolution in Russia, and with subsequent evolution of Marxist revolutionary ideas, <coughs> that sulfurous stratum threatens us still. Questions, thoughts, profound observations? Good, good insight there, uh, John. Um, it was a profound contradiction that he never showed any awareness of, um, that he never resolved, that continued, lived in the French Revolution and in other revolutions as well. Um, it's, it's the it's the contrast, it's the conflict between the sovereign individual who in this, in this worldview is seen as uh, basically good in, its, in our instincts, in our communal uh, togetherness, in a state of nature, um, encouraged to discover ourselves, to express ourselves, to be ourselves without any external restraint. I mean, that idea is, it totally dominates our society. And it, it seeks to destroy, to subvert, to dissolve all forms of external conformity and control. And yet, it leads to anarchy by design as a state of nature, as a state of freedom, as a state of full human expression. Um, and when coupled with this utopian idea, like we can be free together, you know, abolish the police. We don't need police. People will be good without that external restraint. Um, it creates the conditions th in which you then, for a practical matter, need to take control, in which you need to exercise totalitarian control to create, hey Kyle, come on in, to, to, make, to create that kind of society where people can be truly free. It's a contradiction, it's a paradox, and it creates the same thing everywhere it shows up, uh, anarchy followed by totalitarian rule. Yeah, sure. That's a great, great question there, Jeremiah. Um, it's a fundamentally different view of, of people. 
And what you see in Philadelphia in the American Revolution is, uh, is a realism about human character. We can see that humans are made in the image of God. We can also see that humans are deeply flawed and, uh, and, and left to ourselves without restraint will um, oppress each other, will kill each other, will, will go to our worst. And so society, law, custom, tradition, institutions, families, government are there to, um, to gently shape us into, uh, to be our better selves, to restrain our worst selves, and to punish us uh, when we give ourselves over to evil. In the French Revolution, the, in Rousseau's thought, the, the opposite is, is true. Uh, they view the human being as fundamentally good, and all this external stuff corrupts us. And so ideas have consequences. And I think if you look at the history of the French Revolution versus the American Revolution, you look at subsequent attempts to make the French Revolution work elsewhere around the world, it shows the same pattern, the same fundamental contradiction, the same character flaws in Rousseau that have been replicated again and again in these, in these revolutionary movements. And you look at the American experiment in Philadelphia with its um, human realism, its acknowledgement of human evil, the embrace of evil in human hearts, and you see what stability what prosperity, what uh, the social result has been. Um, social harmony, unprecedented in human experience. Quite striking, isn't it? And I think uh, I think if you're able to take a realistic approach of humanity, you're able to take a realistic view of yourself. You're able to say to see in yourself your own flaws. You're able to accept that because in the Christian worldview, uh, there's grace that redeems us from our flaws. Uh, that like I'm forgiven, so I don't have to fanatically camouflage and justify my behaviors by remaking the world with an ideology that makes what I'm doing okay. Do you see how that works? I can accept who I am, strengths and weaknesses, and have a, a realistic program for uh, living out my strengths and minimizing my weaknesses. and and kindness uh, flows, can only flow from self-restraint, from self-mortification, from uh, a rueful view of myself where uh, there but by the grace of God go I. You don't see that in the adherence of revolutionary ideologies. Ideas have consequences. What you believe has everything to do with how you live. And in the case of Rousseau, we see that his ideas flowed from how he lived. His ideas justified his lifestyle and have continued to provide that service for countless others.
in the two centuries, two and a half centuries since. It's quite challenging to think of, well, how do you deal with this kind of thing? And I hope next week as we gather to see the evolution of Rousseau's thought in Marx and the embodiment of those ideas in the Russian Revolution in Moscow and the subsequent evolution of those ideas basically to our day, to our burning cities. Uh, I'm hoping we can have some discussion about how we address that, the challenge of these ideas, these movements, these radicals in our midst. So come on back. Thank you for your good questions.